Um, and so just to review the model here, um, we're going to have some data sets uh, A, uh, which is going to be a stream of elements A1 through up to, say, AM, where um, it's, it's possible that we don't know uh, what the size is, let's say, actually AI. Okay. M and maybe up to this point is some point of AI in the stream, but we have some subset in the, in the first things. Okay, and so the, the model is that this data set is 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 kind of coming in in this in this process, and it's we're, we're getting a data set arriving at every time point, and at some point we've seen we've seen up to point element. AI here, and there's more elements coming, and we have some, uh, we've got some CPU here, um, and attached to the CPU is some small memory, okay, and and the real constraint here is that the memory has a very small space, so, so each of these elements, AI, is going to be in, in some universe um, let's say in some universe n, and so that means that it takes um, space um, space o of log n um, bits to um, represent um, represent um, ai. Right, so if this is the space of all um, of all the um, IP addresses, it takes a log of that many IP addresses to represent this point AI. Okay, so we're having these elements coming in, and um, and the, the length of the stream is going to be m, and we're going to want to essentially at least keep track of how many things we've seen, and so it takes roughly space o of <coughs> um, um, log m um, to um, represent um, on the value of i, which is the index of how many things we've had, that we've seen so far. We'll need to represent other things on the order of i, so they'll also take uh, on these log m bits. So the space of this memory is constrained to be about, um, is going to be some constant times log m plus log n. And maybe we can take this to some power, but maybe the squared potentially. But we want to keep it, basically, we want algorithms that take space on about size log m and size log n, based on these quantities. So the space of all the elements and the space of and the number of elements in the stream. These streams are coming really fast. You may see on like a terabyte of data every day. And, and so, so we want to keep track of this. We can't store all of these elements or um, the, the space of all the elements either. Okay. All right, so at the end of yesterday, I quickly went over reservoir sampling. And I want to spend another 10 minutes or so to try and um, make sure everyone understands this. I think I kind of concluded a little bit quickly. Um, And so the goal here is, is to maintain a random sample SI um, of AI, right? So, so AI is our elements that we've seen so far on the stream, and SI is going to be a random subset of these elements, OK? And we're going to say that for simplicity, we'll say the size of SI is equal to K. So K is some small number, maybe this is 10, maybe it's 100. We want to keep 100 random things we've seen so far. Today. Maybe this is going to be 10,000, right? OK. Um, so then the basic algorithm is you're basically process processing these elements of a one at a time. 
and you're maintaining some random sample, which is a set of size k. Okay, so then we want to say, and we're also going to maintain a counter of the index i, and this will be important. So with with probability, um, I'll do k over i. Um, so um, we'll just make a note. We'll keep the first k elements in S k. So the first k things we just keep all those in the random set. So now we assume that we that i is going to be at least k or at least k plus one. So then with probability, um, let's see, with, with probability 1 minus k over i, we um, um, ignore ai, keep s i minus 1 um, as si, right? So we don't do anything. So with probability 1 minus k over i, so k is going to be a much smaller number than i, so this is going to get smaller and smaller probability. We are going to ignore the new element ai, and we're just going to keep the same random sample. And so, um, and with probability um, k over i, so in the other, other chance, we flip a coin with probability k over i. If it's true, we're going to do this case. If not, we're going to do this first case where we don't do anything. Then we're going to, um, what is i here, just to make sure. So i is going to be how many elements we've seen so far in the string. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to keep ai in si, and throw away 1s in s i minus 1 at random. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, with it, if we do end up keeping k, ai, then we're going to take one of the elements from our set that we've kept and we're going to throw this away. They're essentially where we're placing it with, with, with ai instead. Okay, so, so this is what we talked about at the end of last Friday. So, so is, is the algorithm uh, clear to people? Is there any questions on the algorithm? Okay. So we're always, made, after the first k elements, we've seen them, we're always maintaining a subset of size k. It'll always be a, a random, a uniform random sample of size k um, um, without replacement. So if, um, okay, so, now, there was some skepticism of whether uh, of this algorithm actually works, right? Does this mean actually maintain something with actually a, are all the elements in SI kept with the right probability? Okay, so, so uh, there's, to, to, to prove it in full, there's, there's a, um, you have to really go through it and, um, a little bit more careful inductive um, algorithm. Um, but I'm going to give the basic intuition of, of why this is true. And hopefully, you can then complete the, the inductive algorithm on your own if you want, as, um, as home. Um, <laughs> uh, all right, so, so, so what is the, prob um, the probability that um, that AI is, is kept. Um, and so, so let's, let's first ask, what should this probability be? If, we've, if we have a set of I elements, and we want to keep K of them um, without replacement at random, well, let's pick one of these elements, AI, and say, what's the probability it should be kept? Yeah, k over i. Right. Um, um, so this answer should be um, be k over i, right? Okay. So is this true? So after, just look at the last element here. Is the last element kept with the right probability?
Okay, so up to when we've only processed, let's say we're right here in the stream, we've only processed up to the i minus one first elements. There's no chance of having this element ai in the set. Okay, so then the only time it can be in the set is when we are actually at this part of the processing and we decide whether to keep this or not. Right? And so there are two cases here. With probability 1 minus k over i, we ignore it and we don't keep it. And with probability k over i, we do keep it. Right? So, so, so is, this, is AI kept with the right probability? Okay, I'm getting some blank, blank stares here. Doesn't it also depend on what, how randomly you are in the second uh, case where uh, yeah. this, this, this probability this of k by i? Tiers, uh, like we have to do this inductively, otherwise we cannot prove this. Like this changes from step to step. You know? Yeah, that's true. That's we, true. We but cannot just but, say but what what is the probability that AI is kept? We, if we look at the last element, let's say that we are adding AI now. Yeah. That we just got it in the stream. Yeah. Like, then yeah, of course we can ask this question. But the okay. question is, what happens in the next yeah, step? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is AI still there in oh. the same probability? Okay, so I'm going to get there. I, I, I'm going to get there, but I, I, the, the easiest way to see it is to first look at just this last element, and then we'll kind of, and then we'll kind of go backwards. Yeah, of course it's true if okay. we choose it with probability. Right. right, it's true. So if we, we keep it with probability k over i, and then if we, if we, we choose this step, it's kept at this end step. Okay, so, so, so is this clear to people? Is there a confusion? Just the last element. Okay, so so now um, let's also assume um, inductively. So um, so um, so this is checked. This part is true just for the last time. Um, let's look. Um, inductively, let's look at element a j in a i. So j is going to be less than i. So let's assume that a j is in set i minus 1, which is before this last step, with probability k over i minus 1. Okay? So, so we're assuming that, uh, that we've maintained it here properly. Um, so, so now, um, now we have to prove that AJ is an element S i is equal to K or i. Yes. Right. So, 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 uh, uh, um, so let's look at this. So there are going to be two cases here. So with probability, um, with probability K over i, um, we're adding a new element into the set. So that means we're going to reach uh, we're going to reach this step, <coughs> and so that means that if it was kept, so we're going to assume we'll look at the probability that's in the set at the end of the step. So it's, it's it can only be in the in the set S i if it was already in the set S i minus one. So let's write that as k i minus one. So it was already in the set, and then now it's it's taken out of the set. What's the probability that it's taken out of the set? Nine minus two. Yeah, so it's, this is going to be one minus um, one over k, and so we can actually write this a little bit clearer as k minus one over k. Um, the probability that it's kept. Yeah, so this, this is the probability that it's, it's kept in the set. Okay. Um, so, plus, th there's also the chance that we hit this step here, which means that um, it was, uh, that, it, uh, that we didn't update anything. Right, so this is probability. Um, let's, let's write 
let's write this as uh, <coughs> i minus k over i. And it's only still in the step if it was in this if it was in the set at the start. So this is k over i minus one. Okay. So th this is the probability that we hit the second case. This is the probability that we hit the first case. And it's in the set if it was at at the start, and um, at the start, and then it wasn't thrown out if we hit the first step. Okay. So let's. So basically, I just need to. Hopefully, if I multiply this out, I'm going to end up with this. Okay. So let's uh, let's see if I can do that. Um, so. All right. just in, inside the parentheses, we have the multiplication dot, and then there's a smear, not a one, correct? Yeah, it's a smear. Okay, so let's see. I, I ended up writing this out differently than I had written in my notes, so now I need so to it's, actually it's do the right okay. Does K and K go so out that A multiplying with I minus one is a common? Yeah, common okay. So I'm going to get rid of these guys. Yeah. I'm going to factor out k over i, which is which is the probability I want, right? So this is going to be k minus one over i minus one, and this there's a k over i here as well, i minus k over i minus one. Okay, so now hopefully this these things are going to cancel, and what I'm going to get this is going to be equal to k over i. And if I, this, this should be i minus 1 over i minus 1. And this is 1, so my result is equal to k over i. OK, so if you're not clear on this, you can, there's a, I derived it slightly differently in the notes. Um, and uh, you can kind of, yeah, you can work it out at home as well. It's kind of, Magical that it works, but you know if you think about this algorithm, this is this should logically kind of make sense as well. Yeah. So as the streaming progresses, the probability that the the new element is going to be in the set reduces. That's right. Okay. That's right. Because I'm only keeping a, a fixed number, only only say only ten things in the set, and after I've seen the first thousand, there's a one percent chance I have. After I've seen ten thousand, there's one tenth of one percent chance I have. Right, so the probability should be going down. So, uh, um, so this is useful when you want to take uh, take some sort of random set, and you're, what, what you're doing with this is you're um, running some other algorithm on this, which is estimating some some uh, something about the the whole um, the whole set of data you have, and you have got a fixed budget to run this algorithm a fixed time budget. You want to update it every so quickly to post it on the website. So if the size of that set is increasing, the time to run that algorithm is going to be increasing all the time too. So you want to say, I want to spend one, 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 um, like, um, like one one thousandth of a second, whatever that is, to run this algorithm. I figure out how large of a set I can run it on, and then I maintain a sample of that size. And if it's a random sample, a purely random sample, it's going to be a good um, representative of of the of the full string. So, so it's this is kind of the simplest summary of a string. It's just a pure random sample, and it'll it's it it's useful in, in many contexts. And there's you know you know very very simple algorithm of, of how to keep this. You just need to keep track of this value i. Which is going to take um, log m bits, right? That was this size here, and uh, and then you're going to have these k um, these k values that you keep track of. Each of those is going to take log m bits. So this total space for this, so the total space is is going to be k times log of of n plus log of m to 
you can surround sample of size k. And really, each of these log n and log n, you can think of these as, as kind of like a, a word or you know some 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 small you know but very small uh, piece of memory uh, or a constant number of words. So if it's the space of all IP addresses, it's going to be you know going to store a uh, um, like a few digits for this log n. All right. Okay, so we're going to come back to randomized algorithms uh, later in this lecture, but I want to give another slightly more complicated thing that's actually uh, um, deterministic. Um, yeah. um, are there, how, how hard is it to do the statistical analysis to find the probable error for a given uh, reservoir size? So it, it, so most of those sort of questions, the answer is, is, is already known. There's a lot of work on how large a RAM sample you need to estimate something. Um, like a lot of um, learning theory, which is kind of the theory behind machine learning, looks very specifically at this question. There's a lot of other um, kind of machinery in, in different areas to, to know that. It really depends on the question. Um, but most of that is, is already known if you, if you can map the question to to something else. Uh, okay. Maybe after at, after the lecture, I, if you have specific questions, I can try and point you to what it, what the sample size should be. Uh, but but typically, this you can get bounds on your error. It's, it'll be a relative error um, where the sample size will be independent of the size of the data set. Um, and so so, but then you have to you have to know what the right sizes to get certain error bounds. But a lot of this has been worked out already. But it, it d depends on the question. Um, yeah, I, okay. th 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 there's some stuff in the notes actually on that. I wasn't planning to spend as much much time on that. So we can just cover some other other techniques that have more to do with the streaming. Um, OK, so now the, uh, the next thing we're going to look at are uh, what's called the heavy hitters problem. Um, okay, and so to start this, um, I need to define the frequency. Um, so the frequency of an element J, um, where J is going to be in this universe N. So this is a set of stuff N. Now, I'm writing this thing where this, this, this notation is all integers from 1 to n, but it can really be any set, right? Think of all IP addresses, all words in the dictionary, all sets of two consecutive words, all sets of like, um, like four consecutive letters in a text document. It can be some set here, okay? And it, it's not going to matter so much what it's representing, but it's easier notation to think of them just as integers. You can usually map them to some space of integers. And because we're not actually listing out all the integers for all these algorithms, you can it's going to be useful just to think of them as, a, as, a, as, as just some element of a set that I, I have some integer representation. Okay? And so then fj is going to be, um, we're going to look at all elements in the stream um, um, such that ai is equal to j. Okay, so, look, so, so this is a set. I actually want a count. So I'm taking this, the, the cardinality of the set. So this, is, so this notation, if you're not familiar with it, the curly brackets usually represents a set. This describes the, the things I'm considering, and this is the condition that needs to hold. So it's all elements in my stream such that their value is equal to j. And then the cardinality is, is, the, is the size of the set. Okay. So, so this is the frequency of object j. So let's say you're, you're, looking, you're looking at a stream of, stream of tweets, and you're looking at a, at a certain hashtag. Right? This can be your hashtag that you're, that you're, um, that you're looking at. Um, like, what's a popular hashtag nowadays? You know, I mean, you think that's um, like go youths or something, right? Um, so, so you could say j is equal to um, go things. Okay. So 
j is the number of go use tweets that got it's, sent. So, so you could think of it as the number of, of words you saw in all tweets you were looking at um, that were the, the phrase um, go use. Maybe you only considered the things that started with the hash. So you look at all the hashtags. And only the hashtags, what fraction um, of them will go use. So let's say, um, so, let's, so now what Twitter is doing is they want to find what are the active hashtags, right? What are the ones that are occurring some large fraction of the time? So they want to find all the FJ values um, which are really large, right? So, so then the goal is to, um, 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 the goal is to um, find j such that fj is, is greater um, greater or equal to um, epsilon m. Where m is the total number of elements, epsilon is going to be some parameter. So epsilon is going to be epsilon in, say, 0, 1. Um, I like to think of this equals to, um, say, 1 over 100. So if one out of every 100 hashtags is equal to this. So it's, it, it's um, so, so th this will not be exactly how they do hashtags. There are different modeling issues of the problem. This is a better fit for finding, say, if, if there's an active um, denial of service attack on, um, based towards a certain IP address, you're trying to find the IP address which are occurring at least um, one out of 100 of all of the um, messages pass through a router. And, and th th this might be about the level that you would, you would set this at. Okay. So we want to find all of the all of the, uh, the, the the values such that the frequency um, estimator is greater than an epsilon fraction of all the things passed through. Okay. Okay, so 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 this is the problem uh, that we're gonna tackle, but we're gonna come back to this. I'm gonna talk about a simpler problem first, which is a little bit easier to see how it works, but maybe even, um, but I mean, use even, even less space. So this problem is called uh, majority, okay? And so what I want to do is say, um, if fj is greater than m over 2, um, return j, else um, return anything. So if, if there's, so if there's something um, that's a majority, it occurs more than, more than half the things I've seen are, you know, have the hashtag um, go use, uh, um, then I want to return j. Okay? If, if there's nothing that's over majority, um, then I can return anything. So I can return you know, so it's something completely different. I have no restrictions. Isn't the idea over to find fj, not just j? The goal is find j such that fj. So we don't care about the frequency at all. So, I, yeah, so, so, so in this case, I'm not going to care. It's a simpler problem. For this, we'll probably also be able to get a good estimate of fj. So we're going to be able to ask, we're going to do something stronger. Actually, what we're going to do is, is um, um, for all values of j in, in this space n, I'm, I'm going to be able to return um, so I, I, um, some value f hat j um, such that f hat j is going to be less than f of j and this is going to be less than f hat j plus epsilon epsilon. So for this problem, I'll, I'll come back to this. I'm going to get an even stronger result. So I'm going to be able to estimate um, fj. It'll always be slightly less so I'm going to be estimate this half version of the value, which will always be less than this value, but if I add epsilon m to it, it'll be more. So it can't be too much less. 
So I'll, I'll, I'll be able to give a better estimate here. Um, but to see how it works, it's illustrative to, to first look at this majority problem, which is much, much simpler. So I'm going to return this actually with, with one um, <coughs> counter, which is going to be O of log M space and one um, um, label, which is going to be O of log N space. Okay, so just one counter and one label. So I have a very limited amount of things I can do here. Um, so, so how do I do this? Okay, Robert, you gonna, have you seen this before? Yeah. Do you want me to give the answers? Well, um, how we let the class think about it first, so. Um, Where it says return anything, I assume that means you're not just returning some random number you have to answer. So I'm, I'm going to return a <coughs> some, any J and N. So I'll, I'm going to return some label, and it's a guess, you know. I just want to make sure if there is a majority, I definitely return it. So this is a, it's a pretty weak thing I'm doing. Um, but I'll easily be able to extend it to solve this problem. So let's so don't worry about this. Just think about this majority. So okay. So I only have one counter and I only have one label. So there's not a lot I can do, right? There's there there aren't many different algorithms I can I can run here. And probably the uh, one of the most obvious algorithms is, it, is actually going to work for this. Okay, so let me start writing it out, but I want I want you guys to help me help me finish it. Okay, so bubble sort. Well, <laughs> all right, for each a i and a, um, I'm going to have um, so I'm going to have a so I I'm going to use C, um, which is going to be right. So I'm going to have C, which is going to be a counter, and L, which is going to be a label. Okay. Okay. So what can I do here? So so what? So what happens when I see the first element? If it's the first element, that means it happened more than half the times. I have to I have to keep it right. I have to record it. Right. So. So, so um, and at that point, I'll assume my counter is zero, right? <coughs> so, so let's say, so if C equals to zero, then I'm going to set my label equal to AI, right? Okay. So, so now, if that's if the counter equal to zero, I'll um, what should I do if the counter is is greater than zero? Then you should check if the current element equals a label. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So like now, if L equals a i, then then I'm just going to increment my counter. Else, should I do what if the label is not AI. That should do what? Um, uh, uh, so I think I think um, so you said I should um, uh, um, so you said I should do C equals C minus one? No. I should decrement it? I should what? I think so. Yes? Yeah. Do you say something else? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so, so I, I heard someone say you should change the label. Uh, I was thinking that. So we'll, we'll see something. There is a version of this for this problem where you do actually want to change the label and it works. 
But for that, I'll actually need two counters and two labels. Uh, so if I only want one counter and one label, I, I, have to, I have to do this. If I have two, I can actually swap the label and it'll still work. And that's, the analysis is a bit tricky. So, okay, so the options were either decrement in order to change the label or maybe I would do nothing. Right? If, if I did nothing, then the first thing I saw would always be a counter. If I see something that's different, I might decrement my counter, and eventually it's going to come down to zero, and then I can change the label again. Okay, so, so let's go through let's go through the process A, B, C, B, D, E. Okay? So uh, put another B there just for good measure. Okay. So, so let's see how this algorithm runs. I'm gonna have at every point. I'm going to have a counter, I'm going to have a label. So I'd, initially the counter is zero, the label is empty. I make the counter one and the label A. The counter is going to be two, label still A. Right? The, at B, I need to, uh, I'm going to keep the label A, but decrement the counter to one. Here, I'm going to um, decrement the counter to zero and the label, I don't need to change it, it's still A. But here now, I'm going to have a label, a counter is zero, so I can change my label. So I'm gonna change the label to B, make the counter one. I need to, okay, I see something else, the counter is zero again, I can keep it B. You know, I, I've, uh, I've increased the counter. So, um, so the label records some characteristic property of the element that's currently the most commonly occurring? If it satisfies exactly this property here, if the count is greater than m over 2, then this label is going to be j. If, the, if there's no element that occurs more than m over 2 times, there can only be at most one, right, that occurs the majority yeah. of the time. If there does exist that, it will be in my label. So, okay, so and at the end there were nine things and there were five Bs and, and I've, I've returned B at the end. And that was correct. Right. Um, if instead, it's not that clear. Hmm? If it was A, A, C, C, and then B, if the stream was well, two well, A's, two C, and one B. Okay, A, A, C, C. C, C, and then B. And then B. Okay, so what is this going to return? It's going to return B, okay. So at the end, of this is going to return B. Yes. Right? Well, but is there anything um, that's actually a majority element in this string? No. No. Right, so it's okay. So it means I can return anything. Okay. So the, the basic way to see that this works is to look at every label and think I'm keeping track of the counter of all of them at once. And either it's, and only one of them is going to be non-zero. Right, so every time I see, I see a label, either I'm going to, um, um, so either I'm going to increment the counter, or I'm, um, or I'm going to, going to uh, or if I see something else that's a different label, I'm, uh, um, I'm going to decrement the counter. Um, there's some details on the if statements. I think I've slightly wrong here. If uh, if I see this, I also want to set C equals to one, uh, and then so. But, but then I don't want to enter this step. So there's I've written it out more cleanly in the notes. I think. But if if this, I want to set it to, to one. I think if you don't do that, you can get some similar results. But, okay, so, so every time I see a label, either I'm going to increment the counter, or, um, uh, or um, I'm going to think of adding the counter in, and then I'm going to decrement that counter as well as the counter that, that's in here. Right, so, so I'm either, I'm adding, so if it has the same label, I'm incrementing. If it's the wrong label, um, I'm going to decrement. And I can only decrement for every time that I see something um, 
So the only times I can possibly decrement th this counter is if I currently have something else um, th um, that's not in the counter, but I, I can only decrement those as many times as, uh, as, as I have other elements, and that will be less than m over 2. So eventually, all those counters must be empty. And if I have more than m over 2, this counter will, will have something. So, so maybe the argument will be a little bit more clear. I'm going to talk about a version for the heavy hitters problem um, that will be um, that's going to be more more accurate. And essentially, the same argument will follow, but it'll be more clear why the simple argument um, analysis works. So, okay. So, so for the heavy hitters problem, now I'm going to do this with um, I'm going to have K, I'm going to set K equals to 1 over epsilon. And I'm going to have the ceiling of this, right? Um, so I'm going to have this many um, counters and labels. So instead of keeping one counter and one label, now I'm going to keep K counters and K labels. So I'll describe an algorithm by um, Mishra and Degrees in um, All right. Um, so I'm going to think of having an array C um, with C1, C2, up to CK, and an array L of L1, L2, Okay, so um, so now how am I going to extend this to use k counters and labels to solve this heavy hitter problem? So for each label, you have to have a counter. Yeah. So uh, corresponding counter for each label. So whichever is ma maximum, uh, if the next label is having uh, greater than that value, you have to replace the label. Uh, so, uh, so let's see. So I can only keep track of, so, so I didn't quite understand uh, that description. I don't see how you replace the label of something as larger than. Uh, suppose label 1 uh, has count, uh, counter of 1. Uh, label 2 uh, comes and then count becomes 2. Then you have to uh, take label 2 as a reference. And then keep checking for other labels, which has more count. So, yeah. So, 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 so I'll. I'll uh, so, 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 so that wasn't that clear. You're going to associate every label with one of these counters. So that means for each. So this is going to correspond with an element. And you're going to try and keep track of how many you see. Right? Um, right. So, do, do you want to answer this or? Yeah, the question is what the algorithm, right? Yeah. So, uh, I, my, my idea is the following. If we see the label, we just increment the counter. Okay. If we don't see the label, we take the label with the lowest counter and uh, we decrement. Yeah, or maybe all of them. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So that's good. So, uh, um, so let me start writing this out, and we'll try and try and fill this in. So, if AI equals to some LJ, right? Then we're going to do CJ equals CJ plus one, right? So if we have this label. We'll call this LJ. Then we're going to increment the counter. All right. So, so this is the obvious thing to do if we're keeping track. So, else, if sum CJ equals to zero, we have some counter which is empty. Then that means that it, it didn't match any of our labels, but we have an empty counter. So we may as well start. Keep right. tracking it. 
right? Then we can set LJ equals to AI and CJ equals to one. Okay. Um, so now it's the tricky part. So it did match any of the labels, and none of the counters are empty. So now our labels are full, and we're keeping track of something. Um, so now we need to do something of it, right? So that was that corresponded to this step right here. Okay, this was when we couldn't use a, we couldn't set start a new label, and we couldn't kind of just add to another label. Um, so, um, so Clement, you had, uh, maybe you had a suggestion for what to do in this case? Or anyone else have ideas? Or? Can I just increment by k and decrement all by one? I mean, so, so, so you can increment a bigger number and then decrement by one all the time. So I, I, I'm going to increment what by k? Was I mean, uh, uh, if you have a hit, I mean, the if they are equal to some uh, LJ, the first condition. Yeah. And instead of incrementing by one, incrementing by a bigger number, and then every time they have a miss in all of our counter, just increment all of it. So. That starts sounding probabilistic, though. So, so if I increment by k, then my count's going to be too big, right? Let's say I only saw one element. My string was really short, and I saw it, and I, I saw it twice, right? The first time. Uh, it was in there, so I set it to one. The next time I increment it by k, now my count is k plus one, but I've only seen two elements. So, so that counter will be off. Um, I'm going to have this property where I'm going to have an underestimate. So that's kind of a, kind of a hint. We have to decrement all of them. Can you reduce the least counter? Reduce the least counter, and yeah, once it becomes zero, you can place the limit. Yeah. So, so, so. Um, so there are two options here, okay? So there, there are two very kind of things that s seem to make sense. So one is to find um, min j of cj and set cj um, equals to cj minus one. The other is to for all cj equals, say for all j, set cj equals to cj minus 1. Okay? And then you could say if, well, you don't need to do this. Okay. You can, if one of the counters is empty, you can swap the labels, but that's not going to be needed for the. The analysis. Okay, so we have two two choices. Either we only find the smallest counter and decrement it, or we're going to look at take all the counters and decrement all the counters. Okay, so let's let me give an example input here. A A B C B C B C B C. And so now I'm going to have k equals to 2. Um, so, so let's run both of these algorithms here. Okay, so for the first one, I'm going to have um, c1, c2, and l1, l2. And the other one, c1, c2, l1, l2. Okay, so in the first case, I'm going to have a uh, a1, A1, again, A2, A2. Now the interesting step, I'm going to, um, okay, yeah. So I'm going to put A, B, 2, 1. It's be the same here, A, B. Now I'm going to see C in, in, this, in the second algorithm here where I decrease all of them. I'm going to change this to 1, 0. Um, this is still A. This is still B. Here, I'm only going to decrease the smallest one. So I'll have 2, 0, A, B. So, so then I will see, um, 
see, see this value B again, and I will um, go back to this state. Um, in, in this one, I will see the value uh, B, and I will um, just fill this in, A, B. Then I, okay, now I'll see the value C. Here, I'm going to go back to this state again, 2, 0, A, B. In this one, I do something different, 0, 0, A, B. I get this value B again, um, 2, 1, A, B. I've alternated back to the state. Here now, I've got um, this label B, 0, 1, A, B. Now we see a label C. Here, I'm, I'm back to the same state again. Now I've got 1, 1, C, B. Right? And at the end, I'm going to end up with 2, 2, C, B. In this one, I'm going to always be at 2, 0, A, B. In, in this algorithm, as long, if I keep seeing these pattern of B and Cs, I'm going to keep incrementing these counters and keep improving this estimate. I can keep writing B, C, B, C over and over again. Um, but with this algorithm where I only decrement the smallest one, I'm kind of going to get stuck with this A here. I've only seen it twice where maybe I can see B and C um, like 100 times. Okay, So I need to decrement all of the counters instead of just decrementing the smallest one. So, okay, so let's go back. So let's try and see a little bit more carefully now why we can get this sort of error bound. Let me rewrite this here. We're going to return an fj um, you know, for any, any j in, in n. We're going to return fj hat such that, let's write it this way, fj hat is going to be less equal to fj and fj minus epsilon hat. So, so this is going to be my guarantee. How can I possibly do this for any value j? Right? There could be n different values I could, I could ask the question of. Let's say I ask some, some obscure hashtag. How many times did I see um, x237? You know, hashtag um, j equals x237. Who knows? This, maybe this, someone accidentally typed this once, but, but this never occurred. I claim I can still give this, this estimate. Do you believe that's possible? So, so what I do, let's say I ran this algorithm and I asked for the value of A. I have two counters. The end result is label 2 has counter as, as B and has a count of 2. Label 1 has label has C and has a count of 2 also. But I asked for, the, I asked for A. What's the count of A? It should be what? It's going to be less than these two labels for sure. It'll be less than these two, but I, you know, I have to give some number. So uh, if, if I don't keep the counter, I'm going to return zero, is what I'm going to do. So for most of them, for all except the k counters I have, the answer will be zero. Okay, so for the the other k counters I have, I'll, or for the other k labels I have, I'll return whatever's in the counter, and that's going to be my answer fj fj hat. Okay, so um, all right, so 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 basically one way of viewing this is if fj is going to be greater than epsilon m, I um, um, cannot return zero. Right? If the fj for some j is less than epsilon m, I can return zero 
and I'll still satisfy this property. Right? I can return zero, it'll be less than the true value, but not too much less. Okay, so how many possible different counters could I have which are greater than epsilon n? I'll give you a hint. Right? So think of epsilon as 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 a as a as one over ten. So one over epsilon is ten. So I have k counters. So let's say how many things do I have which have more than ten percent of the, the numbers? I can have at most ten of them, right? Only at most ten things can have ten percent. Right, so if I'm, so I can only return, um, so what? Uh, it's M by T, no, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so, so epsilon M is going to equal to M over K. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a good insight back here. Right, so I can only have K things that have value greater than M over K. Otherwise, I would have too many things. Right, okay. So, now, how to analyze this is to look at, so let's get rid of this red part here. So, so to look at this step and say, how many times can I possibly call this step here, this blue step, where I've subtracted off one from all of the counters? Okay, so so um, let's say that that um, that that m is equal to um, that m is going to be equal to forty and k is equal to ten. Okay, so let's have an example. Or actually, this example here. Let's see. We have m is equal to ten and k is equal to 2, okay? So if I have some counter equal to 0, I'm never going to reach this step, right? And so, so when I reach this step, I've subtracted 1 from all the counters. So, so let's say I, I did this, um, I, I, I reached this step 6 different times. Okay, so how many total things would I have decremented from all of my counters? That would be m minus the sum of the counters. So m minus the sum of the counters. So yeah, but how many? Uh, so so every time I do this, I've I've lost k k things total, right? I k counters. I subtracted one from all. So the total counts I've kept track of is decreased by k. So how many times can I decrease the total count by k? So, so, yeah, so, so let's, let's say that I have three things, a, b, and c, and their true counts are, you know, like two for a, for b I have, four things. For C, I have, I have four buckets here. Okay. So every time I call this step, two of these counters, the, so this is the true count, which I don't know. Two of these counters have been decreased. So let's say I decreased these two. That was what happened uh, um, here. Again, I called this step here, and I again decreased uh, these two. If I, if I called it again, I have to do B and C. I called it again, B and C. And eventually I call it, and I can't, I have to subtract two of the counters every time. So if I have M total things, I can't do this more than M over K times. So this step is at most M over K times. It's actually going to be M over K plus one times because the current label you're seeing, you're also effectively decreasing. 
So it's actually the m over k plus 1 difference. So let's ignore the 1. Okay. So if I can decrease this at most m over k times, that means that an, any, any single counter for a given label has, can only be decreased at this step. So that means that any counter can only have, a, have a, an error of m over k. All right, so, so that means all of my counters are going to be off by at most m over k. I've had decreased at most m over k from each of the counters, so my error is at most epsilon. If I set k equals to 1 over epsilon. Okay, so and I, I claim that I will then get this done. Does this make sense? Does it kind of make sense? You have some confusion. You can kind of believe it works. What is the algorithm supposed to do if, say, no element appears often enough to meet the threshold? Well, then it's it's pretty flexible what it can do. It can return zero for everything. Some things it will have some counts for, and that those will be a little bit better estimate. That it would have otherwise. So, um, so, but if everything is below, everything is below this threshold, then I'm safely allowed to return zero. So, let's say if you're looking for some sort of denial of service attack, right? If everything is below my threshold, there are no attacks. Everything's fine, right? Um, if if I but you, but you still look stupid if your algorithm is returning weird results when there's no. Well, it's going to return a result, but it'll return the value of this, and it's yeah. going to be pretty small. You say, you know, a very small amount of traffic is going here. It's probably kind of just. It probably means that 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 IP address is actually doing something. So. Okay. Um, let's see. So. I've got. 10 minutes left, so I was hoping to cover a bit more, but let me say something about this, this, this algorithm. There's, there's another version which works a bit better in practice. It's, it's a bit more, um, I don't know, maybe this step is a little unintuitive already. Um, but there's something else you can do at this step which will also give you um, some, some guaranteed errors. Um, the other option here is you're going to find the um, um, the min j of c j. Then you're going to set l j equals to a i and c j equals to c j plus one. Instead. So I'm going to find the smallest counter, and I'm going to change the label. Okay, and I'm going to increase the counter. So now the nice thing about this is I I, I don't ever call this blue step, so I never subtract any of the any of the counters. That means my true count, the sum of all the counters, is correct at the end. That's space saving. Yeah. So 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 this is called the space saving algorithm. Um, and this was by. Um, some, like a bunch of people at, um, at UCSB, I think. Um, I think it was like um, Divi Agrawal, um, or, uh, uh, so, so and some students. So, but the, the, this, is, this is more recent. So, um, so it's no longer going to have this guarantee instead. Instead, it'll, it'll give you an overestimate. Some of the counts are going to be too high. Right? Let's say I had everything, all the counts were basically you know, um, 10. Um, and then I see a new element I've never seen before. All of a sudden, I'm going to increase its count. Um, I'm going it, to give it a count of 11 when I've never seen it before. Um, well, the, the argument now is, is going to be I'm going to get, so this guy is going to get some errors. It's going to get me an fj called tilde such that the true fj is going to be less than or equal to fj tilde is less than um, fj plus epsilon m. So now this count is going to be an overcount, but it won't be too much of an overcount. And so there's some, 
some analysis where you can see that these two algorithms are actually fairly equivalent. Um, you, what you need to do is if you, um, the, the, the total thing of all the counters that were not, uh, that you would have had to subtract is, is, is going to be the maximum value that you ever do a swap with you where you relabel things. Um, and so if you look at, uh, so you, you can show an equivalence between these two algorithms and one is a lower bound, one is an upper bound. The space saving algorithm tends to work better in practice because the really large values you're going to preserve much closer. You're probably going to have a lot less error in those. Whereas the, this, um, whereas the space saving will, will um, tend to be, a, usually, um, often this, this bound will be, the, the Misha Grease algorithm often, you'll be much closer to this bound. Whereas the, um, the space saving will be much closer to this bound. Um, it's a little bit harder to see why this argument Okay, so let me just one thing. Shouldn't be there if f j equals is is this, sorry strongly greater I can't be there zero. Yes. Equals is not that. That's, That's good. good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, and the, the last five minutes, let me just uh, give some some overview of some other strategies for this problem. Okay, so um, we have that Misha Green's algorithm. It's going to guarantee that fj minus epsilon m is less than f hat j fj. Um, and it's going to use O of k times log n plus log m space. You have the space saving algorithm, which is going to have f of j is less than f of j hat is less than f of j plus epsilon m. That's going to use the same space here. So there's, there's a couple of other arguments. There's the count min sketch, which is going to, it's going to have a similar bound here. Um, as, as the space saving. Um, but it's going to be randomized and it's going to work with probability one minus delta. And the space that's going to need is going to be um, K times uh, this is for, so it's going to be one over epsilon times log um, times log uh, m plus log n times log Delta. So I have some delta probability of failure. So for the one over epsilon, it's it's by itself. The, the delta is inside the log. So I can make this much much smaller. I can make this one over um, one over a million, and this log term won't be won't be too big. Um, usually, you'll you'll set this term to be something like five or ten. Um, so you um, and there's a count sketch which is going to be f of j minus f of j hat. So it's going to be less than epsilon times f2. And I'll explain what this is in a second. With probability 1 minus delta, it's going to be of size 1 over epsilon squared log m plus Okay, so this has 1 over epsilon squared, so if I want 10%, this is 100. If I want 1%, this is going to be, um, be 10,000. So that's pretty big. But my error is now, it's, and my error is now two-sided. I can't say it's only a lower bound or upper bound. It could be either way. But it's going to be relative to this value of F2. 
f2 is going to be equal to um, the sum of squared square root. Whereas f1 is the sum of fj is equal to m. Typically, f2 is going to be much smaller than f1. Um, yeah, so this term is going to be much smaller. So it's hard to compare these directly. Um, and in many cases, even though you need 1 for epsilon squared here for the same amount of space, this one's actually going to work a little bit better. These are both going to be randomized algorithms. And so, um, so, so either on Friday, I'll either do, let's see, so, so, so let's decide what I do on Friday. Either I'm going to do the count min sketch and the count sketch, um, which are randomized algorithms for the same problem, or I'll talk about other randomized algorithms for um, the problems of keeping, um, like, um, the other problem is you want to estimate F0, which is going to be the size of the set um, A, I, and, and A, such that, um, or, say, set J in N, such that F, J is strictly greater than 0. So this, the number of non-zero elements. So how do you estimate this? This corresponds to, say, how many uh, um, distinct customers came to the site. So you have a, a cookie that you give to all of your, everyone has a cookie when they go to your site, and when they come back, you keep track of, um, of, of, of whether they visited it. You don't want to keep a, a counter for every single person just for your website. You somehow want to estimate this value. Right, so if you see someone, if you just every time you saw someone, so so this is going to be much less than than m, the total number of visits. You want to make sure you don't count the same person twice. So the number of distinct people who visit your site, um, and then you can also say, let's estimate f1, which is equal to m, but using only log log m space. So I said that a counter needed log m space in order to do this, right? Um, but if I'm going to, but I want to do it in log log m space. Um, so how can I do that? Both of these are randomized, are, are, are randomized algorithms. So this is going to have some some error associated with it. Um, this one will be a little bit harder to drive down very far, but it works okay in practice. This one you can make arbitrary small. So I can talk about either one of these two things. So so let's have a show of hands. Who wants to see the count min sketch and the count sketch? Oh, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll first say these are a little bit, it's the same problem and they're a little bit simpler to analyze. These are a little trickier to analyze and would follow naturally from these. Um, uh, but these are on new, newer problems. Okay, so count min sketch and count sketch. Okay, and F1 and, and F0. Okay, and who voted twice? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, okay, so, so I'll, I'll plan doing these, and maybe I'll do these next week, Wednesday as well. Um, so I'll, I'll have another option to go against. Okay.